Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. After the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period, circa 66 million years ago, placental mammals underwent rapid evolutionary diversification, producing the lineages that would eventually lead to familiar modern groups such as the carnivorans, rodents, primates and ungulates. Although probably diverging during the late Mesozoic, the oldest definitive fossils of placentals first appear during the early Paleocene, in some cases as little as 100,000 years after the KPG boundary. These archaic animals emerged very quickly to take advantage of the many open niches after the demise of the non-avian dinosaurs. Although the very generalised appearance and anatomies of early placentals have made them notoriously difficult to classify. Indeed, Many Paleocene mammals tended to possess stocky bills with relatively short limbs, long heavy tails, and very unspecialised dentition, leading to confusion regarding their relationships, and causing late 19th century paleontologists to dump them into big artificial groups based on superficial similarities. Perhaps the most infamous example of this are the so-called condyloths a dubious lineage of basal ungulate relatives erected during the Bone Wars by Edward Drinker Cope to house any hoofed mammal too primitive to be placed in either Artiodactyla or Perissodactyla. However, later studies have shown this group to be a wastebasket taxon, and instead probably represents a hodgepodge of unrelated basal ungulates, with some well-known representatives including the Mesonychids, Arctocyonids and Phenacodontids. Many of these animals do not closely resemble modern hoofed mammals in the slightest, if anything appearing more like carnivorans, and possessing a wide range of ecological niches, spanning from tiny rodent-like climbers to robust bear-like omnivores and even wolf-like carnivores. The task of resolving this mess has only really just begun, with the affinities of some groups like the pantodonts being very difficult to pin down. However, we are slowly getting a clearer picture as to how some former condylarts might be related to modern ungulates. We should probably start with one of the better known of these primitive ungulate lineages, the Arctocyonids. This family, also probably something of a wastebasket in and of itself, includes a fairly diverse range of species, most of which were generalised omnivores. Potentially the oldest and most basal member of this group, was the mysterious and controversial genus Protungulatum, which lived in North America from the Maastrichtian stage of the late Cretaceous to the early Paleocene, between 70 and 63 million years ago. A small animal about the size of a rat, possessing an omnivorous diet and molars similar in shape to those of early artiodactyls, Protungulatum has proven very difficult to classify, with different studies considering it either a stem ungulate or a non-placental eutherian. Indeed, at times it has been considered to be close to the common ancestor of all placentals. This demonstrates the problem with classifying mammals solely by their teeth, as there is plenty of room for evolutionary convergence to take place. Interestingly, studies of its inner ear have shown similarities to later ungulates, meaning that Protungulatum may turn out to be a euungulate after all. Meanwhile, one of the earliest Cenozoic Arctocyonids known from decent material is the genus Loxolophus, which was native to North America and first appears roughly 300,000 years after the KPG boundary. About the size of a house cat, this was a superficially coati like omnivore that inhabited subtropical forests dominated by palms. Walking on plantigrade clawed feet and possessing a long tail, Loxolophus would have been both a capable climber and digger, feeding on a mixture of invertebrates, fruit and soft vegetation. A similar and slightly larger genus, Triacus, also appears during the early Paleocene in North America and was clearly very successful, producing up to nine species before dying out in the early Eocene, existing for roughly 10 million years. Resembling a modern civet or raccoon, Triacus weighed up to 7 kilograms or 15 pounds, and would have been as at home on the ground as in the trees. With a narrow snout, flexible ankles, and long counterbalancing tail, this gemini is probably fed on fruit, eggs, insects, and small vertebrates. In life, this genus would have far more closely resembled a carnivoran than an ungulate, Although, like Protungulatum, studies of its inner ear have revealed a number of derived features also found in artiodactyls, with strong similarities to the basal, even-toed ungulate Diacodexis. 
The civet-like appearance of Triacus also reflects the fact that, despite their differences in modern times, ungulates and carnivorans are actually quite close relatives within Laurasia theria, evolving from a common ancestor that probably looked very similar to Loxolophus and Triacus. Arctocyanids as a whole were common and diverse in North America, and soon spread to Europe in the early Paleocene. One of the larger members of this group was the type genus Arctocyon, which lived in what is now France during the Paleocene, with a name meaning bear dog, which is confusing as a later group of carnivorans, the Amphicyonids, are also known as bear dogs. This robust omnivorous animal ranged from the size of a golden retriever to an Asiatic black bear. With a large skull equipped with tusk-like canines and a prominent sagittal crest, Arctocyon probably lived somewhat like modern bears, being an opportunistic animal capable of feeding on both tough vegetation and meat. It would not have been a fast runner, with the legs being relatively short and sturdy, while the feet were plantigrade and terminated in small hoof-like claws. Its close relatives Mentoclanodon and Anacodon possessed even larger canines, being among the first placental mammals to develop sabre teeth, and probably the most carnivorous of the Arctocyonids. These animals died out during the early Eocene, with their niches taken by the more specialised carnivorous Mesonychids, which may have been close relatives of the Arctocyonids, as well as by early carnivoromorphs. Another family of condyloths sometimes considered to be close to artiodactyls are the peritychids. These were comparatively large Paleocene mammals and were more well adapted for a herbivorous diet, possessing relatively specialised teeth effective for grinding vegetation. However, their overall form was still quite primitive, possessing heavy builds, five-toed feet and long heavy tails. They would have somewhat resembled bears or large civets, and stood on semi-digitigrade hooves which suggests generalist terrestrial habits. One of the earliest and most well-known peritychids was the genus Ectoconus, which is represented by multiple near-complete specimens recovered from the southwestern United States. First appearing about 300,000 years after the KPG extinction event, this barrel-chested herbivore was about the size of a sheep and would not have closely resembled any modern mammal, with perhaps the exception of the aardvark, which also possesses a heavy build, long tail, and hoof-like clawed feet. Ectoconus was one of the largest animals in its environment, and was among the most herbivorous of the so-called condyloths, a trait shared with its close relative, the dog-sized 25kg peritychus. Both were durophagus animals, adapted for chewing tough, low-growing vegetation. It has been suggested that peritychids were close to the pantodonts, another mysterious group of early herbivorous mammals, well, this is far from certain. In fact, pantodonts have, at different times, been considered to be either non-placental eutherians, basal ungulates, or, most recently, as unique members of ferungulata, sandwiched between the ungulates and ferrae. I've covered the pantodonts before, so I won't go into great detail on them here, but they were a diverse bunch, ranging from tiny squirrel-sized climbers to ground sloth-like browsers and even hippo-like semi-aquatic waders. Their closest relatives are probably the bizarre tilodonts, a lineage of digging and rooting mammals that developed enlarged rodent-like incisors. They seem to have originated in China during the early Paleocene and thrived in the hothouse world of the Eocene, feeding on roots and tubers in tropical forests. Some later forms became quite large, comparable to Asian black bears in terms of size, with the genus Trogosus weighing up to 150 kilograms or 330 pounds. The group died out at the end of the Eocene, probably being unable to adapt to the cooling and drying climatic changes taking place at this time. In some recent studies, the mysterious genus Deltatherium has been proposed as a basal relative of both pantodonts and tilodonts. Known from early Paleocene age deposits located in New Mexico, this Virginia opossum-sized animal is represented by a relatively complete skull and scattered postcranial material that indicates a generalised omnivorous to carnivorous diet. The skull was large in relation to the body, with a prominent sagittal crest and sabre-like canines in the upper jaw, features that were quite typical of unspecialised Paleocene placental mammals. In life, it would probably lived much like an opossum, 
being able to feed on fruit, insects and small vertebrates in subtropical forested environments. While the relationships of Delta Therium and the Pantodont remain controversial, we are at least on firmer ground with some other groups of so-called condyliths. A good example would be the Hyopsodontids, a highly successful family of basal ungulates that first appeared during the early Paleocene and dwelt in North America and Eurasia. About 10 genera have been described, although frustratingly very little information about them is available online, with pictures and illustrations being equally rare. Hyopsodontids were typically small animals that had little in common with our general idea of an ungulate, and were more like insectivores in appearance. In some cases, the resemblance to insectivores even extends to details of the teeth, with some forms like Lithomylus possessing molars very similar to those of hedgehogs. The best known Hyopsodontid is Hyopsodus itself, a highly successful genus that occurs in the early Eocene all over the Northern Hemisphere, and survived far into the Eocene as one of the last condyliths. About the size of a guinea pig, and resembling modern hyraxes in appearance, this cute rounded omnivore is known from about 20 different species, and was extremely common in some ecosystems. Hyopsodus would have been a forest dwelling animal, probably lived similarly to modern bandicoots or larger elephant shrews being a staple component in the diets of many carnivorous mesonychids and creodonts. Analysis of the brain case and inner ear have shown strong similarities to those of perissodactyls, especially to horses and brontotheres, strongly suggesting that hyopsodontids were very basal-looking, odd-toed ungulates. This is quite surreal to consider when you think about it, as the smallest members of this family, such as the European Pachytherium, seem to have been rat-sized arboreal insectivores with flexible squirrel-like ankles, about as far from horses and rhinos as can be. This goes to show just how generalised early ungulates were, making the connections to other Laurasiatherian groups such as hedgehogs, carnivorans and even bats much easier to appreciate. Another iconic condylarth group that were also probably stem perissodactyls were the phenacodontids. Like the Hyopsodontids, these were quite long-lived, originating in the Paleocene about 61 million years ago in North America, and persisting into the Middle Eocene circa 48 million years ago. These were among the most herbivorous of the condyliths, possessing relatively advanced cheek teeth for the time, with low ridges suitable for grinding vegetation much like later Perissodactyls. Phenacodontids would also have been quite fast and agile animals, with relatively elongated limbs and reduced first and fifth digits on the feet, anticipating the three-toed perissodactyls that proliferated in the Oligocene and Miocene. Early forms such as Tetraclanodon were quite small, being the size of a domestic cat, while Ectocyon was comparable to a Scottish terrier dog. The incredibly common and gregarious Meniscotherium was similar to the latter, being a terrestrial herbivore or omnivore that dwelt on the forest floor and stood on small, blunt, hoofed feet. The largest member of the family was the type genus Phenacodus, a sheep-sized animal measuring up to 1.5 metres long and weighing at 156 pounds. With an odd mixture of basal and derived traits, mixing an archaic, long, heavy tail with derived limbs and feet, Phenacodus was capable of running away from predators, unlike most early ungulates, and in many ways set the template for perissodactyl body plans going into the Oligocene. In Europe, meanwhile, the endemic Pleuroaspidotherids were successful and common during the Paleocene to early Eocene. Phylogenetic studies have found that these animals were not close to the other condylarth groups, with the possible exception of the Arctocyonids. Two genera, Orthaspidotherium and Pleuraspidotherium were present in France and Spain during the Paleocene and possessed relatively derived teeth adapted for chewing plant matter. Although postcranial remains attributed to these genera are quite fragmentary, it is known that they retained a very basal appearance typical of Arctocyonids, with plantigrade feet, long low bodies, and narrow snouts more like those of carnivorans. It was once thought that Pleuraspidotheriids died out during the late Paleocene, 
Although the genus Hilalia persisted in what is now the Pontide region of Turkey until the Middle Eocene circa 43 million years ago, which was an island at the time. These survivors of an archaic lineage thrived on their isolated refuge, and there were at least four or five species of Hilalia at different sizes, suggesting that they diversified to each occupy a slightly different niche in their ecosystem. It is unclear when this genus died out, although its extinction was likely related to the arrival of carnivorans and creodonts in the region. By the end of the Eocene, the archaic so-called condyloths were staring down the barrel of extinction. Although these generally unrelated animals may not have formed a genuine clade, most do appear to have been basal relatives of the artiodactyls and perissodactyls respectively. The very generalised arctocyonids were probably ancestral to the former, with it being notable that stem artiodactyls tended to be quite omnivorous, with this trait carrying on into modern even-toed ungulates, such as pigs, dweekers and chevrotains. This is not even including extinct forms, such as the mesonychids, entelodonts and the basal cetaceans. On the other hand, stem perissodactyls started out as omnivores, or even insectivores in some cases, but quickly transitioned into full-time herbivory with the odd-toed ungulates producing very few omnivorous species, with horses, rhinos and tapirs being almost entirely herbivorous. While the condylarths were often very successful in their own time, by the end of the Eocene they had essentially been superseded by their more specialised hoofed relatives. However, they stand as a testament to the sheer adaptability of early placental mammals that thrived in the aftermath of the KPG extinction event going from rat-sized omnivores to multi-ton herbivores within the span of 20 million years. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the early evolution of cetaceans and their relatives. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.